all important. We'd love to see so many, so many faces. Um, so, yeah, smart packaging made real. So what we're going to do this morning is eventually, when I stop talking too much, we'll do a live demo with some audience participation. I know how much you all love that. Um, but first of all, a few, a few slides about us. So Cambridge Design Partnership, that's a slightly blurred picture of us, and that's a slightly less blurred picture of us. Uh, that's about half of our facility in Cambridge, UK. Uh, and we are an end-to-end -end, um, design, engineering, innovation consultancy. So we help big brands, small brands, uh, and technology providers to de-risk their product innovation. Uh, and within that facility, there's labs, there's, there's uh, PCB um, construction facilities, there's prototyping facilities, and there's uh, about 140 or so uh, uh, consultants that we have in-house uh, to do all these things. Uh, we've been going for over 20 years. Um, I preempted myself with the slides of, uh, of, of some of the clients that we've worked with over the years. Uh, lots of patterns that we've assigned to our clients. Uh, two offices, so UK and US, uh, and we have our Dutch office contingent here as well, so maybe three offices should be technically true. Uh, and mostly in the healthcare and consumer sectors, and I play the role of digital that then spans across all of those sectors. And I'm here today in my role of uh, all things smart packaging, which again also spans all the sectors that we work in. Right, end of, end of sales pitch. So digital transformation. So quite often our clients come to us and they know they want to do something in the digital space. They almost certainly think it probably revolves around uh, a better connection with the end consumer. Whereas in actual fact, the way we look at digital is that it can play to each one of these topic areas. Clearly, engaging with your consumer is key, but it may well be that there's an even more valid uh, opportunity for digital transformation in your logistics or supply chain, or it might be way, way back in your own manufacturing process that you could apply a digital tool to enable you to get an ROI. So don't always think that it's the consumer or nothing. There are many, many other ways that we can uh, employ digital to, to unlock some new benefit. Who recognizes this fellow? No one, oh, this is excellent. So this, this chap's called Steve. He's from America. Uh, he used to work for a small company called Kodak, and he was the first inventor of the digital camera. And there it is. It's Kodak invented the first digital camera. And what happened there? Well, they, they liked it, and they decided not to go for it because they were worried that it would impact the sales of their printed film which you would, uh, and it did, uh, somebody else did it, and carry on with us. So we always throw up poor old Steve, um, looking slightly less happy now, I'm assuming. Inventing something is one thing, and you know, he invented a brilliant thing, a total game changer of a thing, but invention isn't innovation. What, unfortunately for Kodak and for Steve, they didn't have was the, the business insight. They didn't understand what they would got themselves. They didn't understand the commercial implications of it. They looked at it, saw it as a threat, and tried to kill it. But just because they're trying to kill it doesn't mean that the rest of the world is trying to kill it. Quite the opposite. So always be careful when inventing something that you need the, 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 the commercial side of the business case. You need to understand the end user. What are they actually going to buy? What do they value? As well as the tech. Kodak had the tech. Unfortunately for them, in this case, they didn't have the other parts of the puzzle. Another example, slightly closer to packaging, who's come across the Dollar Shave Club? A few more, okay. So the Dollar Shave Club became the billion dollar shave club a few years ago when Unilever paid a billion dollars for it, which is quite a lot of money for a loss-making startup of 150 people that even admitted to the market that their razors aren't the best razors. They're off-the-shelf razors. That's not what Unilever paid a billion dollars for. But what they do have is a subscription model. They have a very slick digital service back end. They have an automated reordering process, and they have, I think, a three million uh, user subscription base. That has value, and if you're a Unilever, that has a one billion dollar value to it. Um, not so bad if you're one of those 150 people that are effectively more sort of programmers than anything else. You know, it's all about the software stack to enable this digital service to work and work reliably, and that has value. So please, for all of your markets, consider how this value shift is happening to you. Yes, you might make fantastic products, but that's no longer the end game. 
product needs to be good enough, but maybe there's a big opportunity to have a digital service that wraps around that product, and it may be that that is where the value actually resides. Knowing your consumers, knowing their purchase habits, knowing their usage habits, that may well have more value than the thing that you're trying to sell. And we often put up this slide for our clients where we're trying to help them unlock digital. Um, so there's no way we're going to be able to point up at that huge slide at the top, but basically on the, the left uh, smaller loop, this is where our clients think initially they, they have to play. They have to find a new way to unlock this, the, the potential of digital. So here, this is the really challenging bit. So can we find something that the user's done, maybe an app that, it's, that they've downloaded or the connection that they've made with us, that allows us to feed some context and some information back around the loop such that we can plug it into the development roadmap and make a better product and, and therefore uh, keep their engagement. The challenge is, if it is an app or something similar, they have to do something. They, the, the consumer has to have already decided that there's value in this new relationship and they then commit to doing something. And that's quite an ask for your proposition. It needs to be quite stellar, quite impressive for a consumer to come along and go, all right, do you know what, I will go on the app store, I will press this, I will commit this, I will fill in my details. That's a big ask, and it's one that you don't have control over. So if you think that you've got, you know, your business case says, well, we'll spend, I don't know, 200 million pounds developing X, but that's all right, because we'll get 300 million back when all of our consumers use it. No, they won't, maybe 10% will, maybe 5% will, maybe no one will. So it's a very risky ROI. And maybe actually that bigger loop on the right hand side of the page is more relevant. It's less glitzy, it's less glamorous, but maybe there's an opportunity within your own company, maybe it's a manufacturing opportunity or a logistics supply chain opportunity, where you do control the show. You can invest something over here and you should expect to win something over here because you can control every interface. It might still require your own staff to download something, but so be it, they're your own staff, you should be able to dictate that. So you get control of that loop, and in some cases, that loop interacts with the other one. So it might be that you found a commercialization route to get tech on pack, and then maybe that that same tech can be interacted with via the consumer. So then you're still in with the consumer, but you haven't had to rely on their involvement to get the ROI. So a few examples, who's come across Tile? So this is really cool, uh, but a kit, so the, the, the tile device is a little square thing hanging on the edge of the handbag. So this is a Bluetooth low energy device, interacts with your smartphone, you clip it onto something of value to you. So we've got this thing sewn into our kids' toys at home. And basically, it's a proximity location thing. So if, for whatever reason, you are parted from your device, it alerts you to say, I can no longer see the thing. If you're 30 meters or more, or usually about 50 meters or more, away from it, it alerts you on your smartphone to say, oh, hang on, if you set off in the car with the kids, their teddy bear's still stuck at home, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> Very clever. Has saved us an awful lot of grief. The really clever thing is, if you really lose your thing, it then uses crowdsourcing to help you find it. So the Tile community, i.e. all those other users that have got the Tile app, without them knowing, and without charging them any money or showing them anything, they effectively become an extension to your Find Me service. So if they, purely by chance, if they've, I don't know, driven down the road and you drop your keys on the pavement, they will have the same interaction with that device that you would. They don't know it because they don't know you and they don't know that your keys are on the pavement, but the tile system does and it will alert you to say your, your keys have just been found at this location. So it's a very clever um, crowdsourcing opportunity to almost interact at a, nearly a GPS level, but never going anywhere near the complexity and cost and battery consumption of GPS. It's using the phones of the community as a sort of pseudo GPS. Very clever. Another one that's quite clever, who's aware of the Amazon Dash buttons? Has anyone used them or been aware of them? Yeah, so Amazon have actually finally killed off these buttons, which is a relief because I was never a huge fan. But for those of you that don't know, so this is a button that you basically you stick next to the goods that you're about to reorder and it just makes the reordering process that tiny bit more seamless. The one that I want to highlight is the white one on the right hand side with a sort of gold logo. So that's one that we did for Vodafone. And the difference there is this doesn't require any connectivity or pairing setup. So if you recall my double loop diagram, all the other devices need the consumer to do something. You receive your Amazon Dash button, you don't have to pair it with your home Wi-Fi, and then it works. But that crucial, what do I need to do to set this up? That goes away with the white version because that white version is direct to cloud. So that 
almost consider that white one a mobile phone in a box. You literally get it out of the box, you stick it wherever you want, and it's communicating right to the cellular uh, uh, infrastructure. No setup. And the implications of that are potentially huge. If you think in medical devices that want to go connected, they still have to have a setup and they still have to have an app. What if my medical device looks and feels identical to the one I'm using at the moment, you know, inhaler or auto injector, and now when I use it, it pings data up to the cloud. I don't have to do anything. I like that because I didn't want to download the app in the first place. So direct to cloud, I think, has huge implications for this sector. And we're in one of them, so we've got to show these guys. So, to be clear, there's nothing that we did on this bottle, but we're a big fan of it. So this is using a lot of tech on the underside of a beer bottle. And if you can see the print along the bottom, I appreciate it's a little bit blurred. But basically, the lights um, light up when people cheers each other in a club, as they take a drink. As they leave the bottle, the lights will go out and say, oi, drink some more Heineken, please. Uh, really fantastic, immersive experience in the club environment. Very, very good. Um, I'll flip these because I'm a bit short of time. So, Digital introduction, uh, and I want to get on to the, the fun part of the show. So we've developed some toolkits uh, here at Cambridge Design Partnership to help our clients to sort of, within all that noise and that sea of opportunity, try and break it down to some uh, pragmatic steps. Uh, and I use the Heineken bottling example again here with this plot, which is, there's two things going on in, in, in my mind in the digital space at the moment. There's this perception idea, i.e. brands trying to convey trying to do in the space, which is, in my mind, really conveyed very well in that Heineken bottle example. That isn't a scalable technology. I mean, I don't know what the filler materials cost of their little light widget is, but it's certainly not going to be particularly cheap. So they're not looking to scale that to be available in every retail outlet. They're using it very specifically to, to project a very clear brand message of, we get digital, we get immersive user experience, we get events, we get the experience side, and that's sort of the gray plot. In reality, they may well be, and I think lots of brands are taking much more smaller, more pragmatic steps along the way. And it may be that the red and the grey line never join up. That's also fine. But I think what's really important for your brand is to make sure what trajectory are we on? Are we trying to convey something to the market as we're a sort of a thought leader? Or are we trying to do much smaller, potentially less sexy steps to get some ROI out of this? And those two things are very different. Uh, and we've built these toolkits, you see them labelled along the bottom, there's eight toolkits which are designed to help a client to say, okay, if you're at one of these four bubbles, which you probably are for a given project, a given launch, there are some things that we can, we've got right out of the plan that will help you straight away to better de-risk what it is that you're working on. Uh, and that can be you know, better quantifying the user experience, um, that can be building a business model for you guys, and that can be even just pulling in data that you've already got and using an independent set of eyes to, to analyse it. And a few of these toolkits are one of what I want to pluck out today. So um, this um, digital stimulus stuff we've covered in previous IEPs. So this is where we basically look across the entire sector because we're not trying to sell any technology. So we're in a lovely position to just look at everything that's on the market and give our clients an independent summary. So this is an example in the medical space. So we evaluate, okay, they say they do AI, but do they really do AI? You know, how much financial backing have they got? And what do we think of them as an organisation? And we do this for every single company that we're, that we're challenged to, to review. And again, in the small packaging sector, we've done exactly the same. Uh, we've stolen AFE's pretty diagrams. And per sort of vendor type, we've gone in and we've assessed what those clients do. Do they have the IP they say they have, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's all about, in my mind, sort of cutting down through the noise to get to the so what's. Who really is differentiated? Uh, another toolkit that again we've covered here on this stage, I think last year or maybe the year before, is Dialog, where we hide consumer grade wearables technology into products. And I do mean hide. So we've hidden it in shampoo bottles, razor blades, uh, we hid it in this Avon face cream, which is just the example we used two years ago. And this is all about better understanding the in home user experience without annoying the user. So they are told that there is this tech hidden in their product, but I can assure you they quickly forget because a lot of them lie. Um, so for example, um, top left, four out of the 10 users of a particular trial um, had stopped using the product within three weeks, and yet every night they were still filling in their questionnaire to say that they were still using it. It's surprising. Uh, and there's countless more examples. I think we've done 12 or 13 of these trials now, and they always uncover some genuinely bizarre, unexpected results where people 
essentially like. I appreciate they're probably not thinking that they do, but they do. Uh, and I'd much rather, if I were trying to develop some disruptive tech, I'd much rather base it on quantifiable evidence like this, rather than what people say they do, because there's always a risk that we get it wrong. Right, we've got time, it's good, we've got 10 minutes, I think. Um, so this is the audience participation part. So this is uh, learn fast user testing. So what we're going to do here is get you to all help us to uh, evaluate a new piece of technology. So if I can ask my glamorous assistant, uh, or Bastion, uh, to come to the stage, we'll just turn on these beacons. Uh, so you're probably wondering what these are, which is fair enough. So these are triangulation beacons. Are they hopefully, are they both flashing? Give it a wiggle. Um, so if you all take off your ID badges, you'll see that we've already, we're already monitoring you. Um, you'll see we've got some tech on your ID badges, and it's these badges that we're going to vote with in a second. So it's a bit like the Slido uh, app voter, um, but very different. So we've been to various conferences like this where you have this sort of online app voting system, and to be honest, I find that what it does is actually allows the audience to completely ignore me. You know, I basically say, download this app, now please look at your phone for the next 10 minutes. I've lost you all. You know, you've all come to well, allegedly look at my, my face, maybe not. Um, so I don't actually like these usually. I appreciate what they're trying to do, but you, you inevitably lose the audience because you'll see some important email that's popped up or some message and all of a sudden you're gone and you're not going to come back to me. So we're trying to do a Slido, but we're trying to do it at a human level. So rather than us humans have to obey the available tech, we've developed some tech, and it's a bit wobbly, so bear with us, but we're wanting to evaluate that tech by making the interaction much more human. So what we're going to get you to do is vote with your badges. So here we are, this is what's going to happen. So these two beacon devices help us to triangulate all of your various signals from your badges. Um, and I'm going to ask you a few questions where the answer to this question, if you agree with A, I mean you just stand up and wave the badge as frantically as you can in the air. And if you think that B is the correct answer from your perspective, I'll need you to remain seated and hold the badge as still as you possibly can. Okay? Right, so here we go. What could possibly go wrong? So first of all, let's just do a, a technology check and see if this thing's actually going to work for me. So, if you answer A, this is your first IEPA event. So anyone that's never been to IEPA before, please stand up and wave your badge. You need to stand up. You need to help us out here with the tech. Okay. Okay. I think it is working. Okay. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Wow. It actually works. That's quite a lot of you, actually. If you said there'd be lots of people coming back, why all these new people? Ah. Ah. Oh. I, you're not the first. <laughs> Okay, I think, I think we're about, yeah, I think that's good. Right, thank you. Good. The technology works. Well, that's a relief. Um, let's try the next one. Right, so do you feel technology is either A, pushing us further apart, or B, bringing us closer together? Vote now, please. Right, here we go. Pushing us further apart? No one thinks it's push. We have one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I suppose we you know what? We have some technology vendors at the back saying, yeah, you know, it's definitely pushing us further apart. It's going further and further. Oh my lord, this is remarkable. I suppose we are all in the technology game, so maybe uh, has it stopped? Wow. Well that's that's conclusive. Excellent. Okay. Well it's safe to all getting up, I suppose. That was a good lazy one. Okay. Question two. Is your company A, investing in smart packaging to connect to users, or B, do you think your company is actually just waiting for other companies to, to take the punt and you want to see who's going to win? What do you think is more, uh, what do you think is more, oh, oh, this is interesting now. Oh, oh, oh. This is good to see, it's going, it's going. There's not many people, this is quite encouraging. Yeah, okay. Well, what's it say? Yeah, it's about sort of two thirds. Two th good. Well, there you are. Technology is investing. Okay. Don't worry. There's only five questions, so we're nearly there. I appreciate this demo quickly becoming slightly less um, So, question three: Do you think you are a well equipped on all matters IoT? 
if you don't know what IoT means, you probably need to answer B, I guess. <laughs> um, well, the quick all matters IoT, or B, you're behind the curve a little. Right, let's try voting. Let's reset it. Okay, here we go. Oh, oh dear. There's not many A's, is there? Oh, we're falling. We're falling. We're still, is it still falling? Yeah, it's still falling. Keep waving, keep waving, keep waving. And all those people that disagree, please hold it really still. <laughs> Unbelievable. Some, there's some crazy voting going on. Thank you. I think that's, yeah, about one quarter, four quarter. Okay. Right. Nearly there. Do you think that your consumers, A, engage or would engage in this, what we're calling gesture-based technology, is what we're calling this crazy, wavy thing. Do you think they would engage with it, or do you think they would consider it an absolute gimmick? Reset. Go. Come on. <laughs> it's a gimmick. Uh, Bastion, it's time to kill them. What are you going with? I'm not sure. It's, about, it's, about, it's, about, it's probably less than 50, isn't it? Is it going? Oh, yes, we're going. Okay, we'll call that, we'll call that a meme. <coughs> final, final question. So, do you personally, this is just a question for you guys, not your end consumer, but you, do you like this app free experience? Wave it in the air, or do you worry that it tries to solve something that isn't actually a problem? Final question, I promise. So, personal views. Did you like the gesture based, or would you rather go back to some app? Yes, come on. Come on, definitely wait. What's it going on? Yeah, interactive, this one. Immersive. You're more human. Look at you, you're smiling. No one, no one smiles with those apps. The app won't catch on. New technology. Fantastic. Right, that is absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Please relax. Give yourself a round of applause, actually, for that. That was wonderful. Thank you. Right, I appreciate it. I'm very short. Sure. Oh, this is brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I love this. <laughs> I'm going to do the reveal now. Yeah. So, um, is, it, what's that? is there really a YouTube thing? Is, is, it, is it, There's or a real thing. It's, it's, it's all fake. It's all fake. So, this is called Wizard of Oz testing, where, like the Wizard of Oz, the film, you simulate an interaction in the hope that that interaction is plausible enough that everyone believes it, and therefore the responses I get from you are real responses. In reality, this diagram missed a few things. It missed the fact that I was controlling it entirely myself, <laughs> and it also missed the fact that these beacons are entirely fake. There's a full of champagne in it. So, there's nothing in here. <laughs> what there is, is there's a blinking LED. Quite, quite I'll just turn that off. Um, and the cunning voting app, this is where you really get upset with me, um, is a tiny bit of Python code controlled by the mouse pointer. <laughs> so that's me. Just cunningly, I can just look at you and work out what you're voting. I don't actually need to implement the technology. And I can assure you, if we had implemented this technology, it would be bloody expensive, because it's almost impossible to do what we've just done. And if some of you didn't like it, that's probably a good thing, that we would have wasted about a million pounds. So, to conclude, um, <laughs> so to conclude, digital is hard, but it can also be fun, so there you go, we've all learned something. Um, let's all think about how we get value not only from the device, but also from the data that it gives us. Uh, and yeah, if you are about to embark on some really differentiated and complex and expensive digital journey, Please, please, please consider toolkits like I've mentioned, particularly the Wizard of Oz stuff, to say, do you know what, could we fake it? Could we fake what we're thinking of building so that if we do decide to go ahead and build it, at least we know that the consumers actually like it. We've tried it on them, they like it, now let's build it. There's a much, much more sensible way to progress than embark on some crazy, complex, and expensive ecosystem to then find it's a flop in the market. So please challenge yourself to think of new ways to test this work. Thank you very much.